wonderful to come to the line in El, preparation for the Yom Roy. And we don't write off the possibility that you'll be here for this year. What I'd like to share with you is some ideas from the Rambam and Hilchus Chuba. And I'm going to leave time for questions because people often have unresolved questions. My training is in philosophy, uh, both Hashkafa Satoru on the one hand and secular philosophy on the other hand. Um, questions in other areas, if you ask, if I happen to know the answer, I'll be happy to try to answer. But that's where I have my training. Rambam and Perak Beis of Elam Beis and Hilchus Shuvah defines what Shuvah is. And these are his words. Umahi at Shuvah. What is Shuvah? Who? She azos chotei chet o. The transgressor should abandon his chet. Viyasiro mimachshav to. Should push it out of his thoughts. He should resolve in his heart that he shall not do it again. So this is what we typically call Aziba Sechet, and it has three pieces. One is, Yazor Bechote Echato means stop doing it. Stop doing it. Push it out of his thoughts, trying to train himself to think about other things or to make certain connections with that thought that give it positive spin and resolve in his heart not to repeat the sin. Well, all three of those together don't say anything about his success in the future. Will he succeed in keeping this resolve till the end of his life or will he not? The words here do not say. They're not committal. That's one element of truth. He also should regret what he has done in the past. The Pasuk says, after I have returned, I regretted what I did in the past. So that's the second component. And the two components are really independent of one another. A person can decide to change his behavior for a lot of reasons. His attitude may be, it was wonderful while I had it, but it's now become illegal, or too expensive, or too fattening, or whatever you like. And it's just become something which I have to give up. So here, the, the, the Mitzvah Chuba requires not only that the person give it up, for various reasons, but he has to regret it. That's the feeling, I wish I hadn't done it. We all have this experience when you think about the past, and you think of something you did, and you have that sinking feeling in the pit of your stomach. Like, why did I do that? Why did I do that? I shouldn't have done that. So that's the second component. Now it says, V'ya'id alav yodeh ta'lumos shalai yeshu v'zerachet la'olam. If you translate this from the dictionary, what it says is, he who knows hidden things, that's the creator, should give testimony that he will not return to this head forever. If that's what it means, then the structure of the paragraph is a little peculiar. First he starts with a, abandoning the head, then he moves to regret, and now he says, and by the way, he won't go back to it again. That should have gone with the first part. Does it make a difference? Yeah, it makes, it makes, I can't do this. I'll show you the difference it makes. Because the portion that I have below, I'm going to reject that translation of the words. Ah, and I'm going to reject them very, and then get the right translation of the words, then it'll fit where it is. Is it good? Is it, uh, that's no, right. I'm saying, but it's not, it's not Torah, right? Does it really matter the order that the Rambam put it in as long as you understand the concept? Okay, that's an interesting question. Uh, I agree with you. It wouldn't matter if you understand the concept, but... If you can't explain the order, then you probably don't understand his concept. It's the Rambam talking to us here. I'm trying to understand what the Rambam says. If it's out of order of normal development, then I have to ask myself if I'm not missing the point. And in fact, as we'll see, it is missing the point. 
And then he brings a proof to this idea of, of testimony. These are people who are doing Jew from Abor And they say, we will no longer take the work of our hands and declare them to be our God. Okay, those are the words of the person doing tshuva. I'm not going to do this anymore. But what this is supposed to be a support for, or proof for, is the statement that the Creator will give testimony that I'll never go back to it again. How do the words of the penitent, the person doing tshuva, who says, I won't do it again, constitute a proof that a Kosh will give testimony that he won't go back to it? What's one thing I have to do with the other? We'll answer these questions and look at the commentaries below. The third thing that he has to do is be doing. Okay, that's the first thing. Okay, that's the first The third thing that he has to do is be doing. Be doing to a Kodesh Baruch Hu. And his be doing consists of saying these things that he, he uh, um, fixed in his heart. The things that he resolved in his heart. So the last sentence says, you, I just told you two things you're supposed to do in your heart. And those things have to be spoken out. Okay, now uh, let's read the Kesef Mishnah and we'll see what to do without those words. The Yoid Alav Yodei Talumos. And by the way, if God is giving testimony that I'll never go back to the transgression, why is his title Knower of Hidden Things? I would have thought a much more relevant title would be Yodei Asidos. He knows the future. He can give testimony by knowing the future. That could it be that the hidden things are the future? It could. It's just not as felicitous. It's saying it straight out, since that's what it's supposed to mean. So, because the Krishna says, he quotes the words that we were talking about, my Yeshua, Yoida love your dear Talumos, you told my he shall ask. Mariah may be me. What kind of proof is he bringing from the verse? No my old hangle, my old hangle. How does that quotation that we speak when we say we're not going to do the transgression again support the idea that God is going to give testimony? It's, uh, to explain it, you could explain the words as follows. He takes the Kodesh Baruch Hu as his witness that he will not go back to it. Yoid, if you know Hebrew grammar, is a, is a hifio. It's a causative. It can mean to give testimony, but it can mean to take someone as my aid. You're my witness that I did this, that I mean this, that I said this. I'm taking you as my, wit my witness. And the Lechem is going to this, doesn't explain it anymore. So the Kesem is saying, don't read it, God will testify. Read it that the penitent will take a Kodesh Baruch as his witness that he won't go back. And then the quotation from the verse is very good. The quotation is the words. Thank you very much. The quotation is, is the words of the person doing tshuva, and what he says is, "I'm not going to go back to it anymore. I take a kodesh baruch Hu as my my witness that I mean it. I really mean it." Sorry, doesn't maybe the Rambam somewhere else had another element regarding future behavior, and that is that he has to be confronted again with the same sin and resist it and not do it. Without looking to do it, obviously, because you can't put yourself in that situation. Very good. That's the halacha uh, alaf in this parak, which I skipped. But there he talks about tshuva gevura. That's why this halacha starts with mahi ya tshuva. And halacha alaf he talks about tshuva gevura, which is a much higher madriga, a much higher level, and it's a separate performance. This is tshuva. And tshuva doesn't require it. Only tshuva gevura requires it. Higher level. It's a much higher level. In Chuba you have to be confronted with the same temptation under the exact identical circumstances, and this time act correctly, and act correctly because you've done Chuba. Allah begs that we're studying doesn't require that. It doesn't require that. It just requires that the, the, the sin not be repeated. You'll ask me, what's the doctrine mean? What's the difference between the two of them? I'll tell you. I think that Allah Abbas here could be described as strategic Chuba, and I'll give you an example. <laughs> Fred, Fred lives in New Zealand. Fred's a nice guy, reasonably good needles, pleasant fellow, except for one person, up with whom Fred cannot put, as my British friends told me to say. 
<laughs> when he's together with this pal fellow, he goes to pieces, becomes irritable and aggressive and behaves badly, and he hates himself for it, and he, and, and he, and he despises the, that way of behaving, but he just isn't getting control. I don't say can't, but he isn't getting control. So what does he do? He moves to New Zealand to, to retrofit Iceland. Iceland, nobody there bothers him. Nobody there triggers him. He's fine. When he hears that that fellow's moving from New Zealand to Reykjavik, he moves to Los Angeles. He just stays out of his way. Has he done chula? Yes. Okay, so I think many people have intuition. That's too cheap. What do you mean? He's just avoiding the, the problem. But let's look at the definition. Has he stopped doing it? Yeah. Has he resolved to stop doing it? How much money he's putting into moving around the globe to stay away from it so he shouldn't stop doing it? He definitely has stopped doing it, has resolved not to repeat it. Does he regret it? Sure he regrets it. That's why he's running away from it. He thinks he's terrible to do such a thing. Did he say, did he say, be doing? We can put that into the example also. Yeah. He said, be doing? That's chuba, but it's not complete chuba. Complete chuba would mean actually passing the test of being in those circumstances. And if you will ask, as you have a right to ask, well then, does it mean that part of the project of Chuba is to seek out those circumstances to test yourself so that you can qualify for complete Chuba? The answer is absolutely not. Because the example that the Rambam uses, which is a Mishnah and Yuma, is that of illicit sexual relations. And that means you have to be, as the Rambam writes, the Mishnah writes, alone with her and not sin. But he's not allowed to be alone with her. That itself is an event. So the Mishnah is choosing a case where you can't reproduce the conditions. And that means that part it's not part of Chuba to repeat, reproduce the conditions so that you'll be favored with uh, com uh, doing complete Chuba. Read that up to the third book. You don't to put yourself in a dangerous position. Bid to you, Brother. Shalantha says, Chok Chayim, life wisdom is stay out of trouble. Stay out of trouble. You know, you're in the elevator, you're working on the 87th floor, and it goes up, and people get on, and people get off, you're reading the Wall Street Journal. And uh, you're getting close to the 80, and people are thinning out. And between 83 and 84, the alarm bell rings, and it's stuck. Uh, you're stuck in the elevator. You look around. It's just you and her. Mm, it's just you and her. Well, you are, who can arrange that? You can arrange it. <laughs> but don't you look for it. You're not supposed to try, try and arrange it, but it's awesome to arrange it. So, a chuba gemur is something which happens when a gemur who wants you to be able to accomplish it. But not more than that. That's chuba gemur. This is plain chuba, card variety, which can be done strategically. So, the Kesa Mishnah says that since I'm taking him as a, a God as an eighth, that I really mean it, then the, the verse which, which quotes what I say, I'm not going to make uh, gods anymore. Uh, idols anymore works very well. It's it's my statement of my sincerity, not that he's going to make give testimony that, uh, and I won't go back to it in the future. The Lecha Mishnah makes another point to get to the same conclusion. He says, "The Yoidel of Yodei Talubos, the second line, the Entoma, if you lay us, Eich Hakadosh Baruch Hu Yaida Love Kach. How could it be that Hakadosh Baruch Hu gives testimony that he won't go back to the same transgression? Bechilo Nishara Habechira Biyadol." Doesn't he have free will? No matter what chuba he's done now, no matter what resolve he's done now, how can you guarantee that he's not going to go back and do it again since he has free will? The Pesach says that God doesn't trust even in his holy ones because no matter how holy they are now, they could deteriorate. We can say that the understanding of the verse is this. When he does tshuva, Tzorach Yekabal Alav Le'eid L'Hashem Yisbaruch. He's got to accept Kodesh Baruch Hu as his witness. Shlo Yeshu V'Zerach Et Lo'olam. It's he, the person doing tshuva, who's saying, I'm not going back to it. And he takes Kodesh Baruch Hu as his aid, and he really means it. Well, there, now if you want to see linguistically how this works, he brings a famous passage. Lo'aid Oli, as a Shemayim as Oretz, I take the heavens and earth as my witnesses that I warned you. What does the verse say? We've been quoting the whole time. It gives a little more context. You return to God's Baruch, according to him, you're speaking to him. 
Nikki is said to a Kodesh Baruch Hu, and you say to him, I'm saying that I won't go back to that same transgression. It means I'm taking you as my witness that I really mean this. But there's no hint here that he will never go back to it. And therefore, temporary tshuva is valid. Temporary tshuva is valid. So some of us, maybe everyone, has had the experience that Yom Kippur comes, and you think about the past year, and yeah, there's X there. X is there. It was there. And I put it on my list. I come, you know, my father, Al Chay. X is there. And by the way, the X was there last year also. And the year before also. And the year before also. And it's, I don't seem to be getting anywhere. I don't seem to be accomplishing anything. That's just stuck with this, this thing which I don't conquer. Does that mean that the chuba I did, each Yom Kippur, is retroactively invalidated? So that I really didn't do tshuva? The answer is no. Temporary tshuva is valid. And if at the time your res resolve is honest and sincere that you're, that you're not going back to it, if uh, this is October, if in May or June circumstances conspire and the temptation becomes overwhelming, I don't say you can't, but you don't master it and you, and you don't uh, succeed, that doesn't mean that in October you didn't really mean what you were saying. You really did mean what you were saying. It's just that you weren't able to keep it consistently forever. So that means each year you have the opportunity to throw off responsibility for the last year's transgressions. And if you go back to it, it's a new slate. It's a brand new slate. The Minchas Chino uh, illustrates this with a famous Gemara. Maybe you've heard of this Gemara. Uh, it's in Kedushin. A man says to a woman, let's be married. Hi, the Kedusha Slee, here's the ring. With a, with a tenai, with a condition that he puts on the condition. On the condition that I'm a perfect son. Okay, that's what he says. And she agrees, and he gives her the ring. What's her status? Says the Gemara, and then before she says, Suffolk Mikudashes, maybe it's valid. Shema, hear her, tshuva, belibo. Maybe he had thoughts of tshuva in his heart. And therefore, maybe they're married. So the Menachem Sinov says, let's figure this out. Let's figure out the scenario. He comes up to the Chuppah. He's a Russia Gomer. A field of Russia Gomer. Al Capone. That's who he is. <laughs> Stands there under the Chuppah and says this shocking thing. Let's be married on the condition that I'm a perfect, uh, perfect uh, tzaddik. She says yes. And afterwards the Gomer says, maybe they're married because maybe he had thoughts of tshuva in his heart when he was standing under the chuppah. He asked the Menchus Chinuch the following question. He walked up to the chuppah, Al Capone. He said those words under the chuppah. How did he walk out of the chuppah? Did he walk out of the chuppah as Al Capone again? Did he walk out of the chuppah as the Chafetz Chaim? Or maybe there isn't enough information in the description to decide, determine how he walked out from the chuppah. That's the, the Menchus Chinuch's question. Let's take a show of hands. How many think that he walks out again like Al Capone? Okay, how many think he walks out as, as the Chavetz Chaim? How many think there isn't enough information to determine? Okay. It's not relevant, is it? I'll show you. I'll show you. Can conditional marriage? Of course. Yeah. Do you make any conditions you want? Is there a third option? Well, you can make a condition that it should remain for a month. She doesn't have to accept it. You're a jerk. What are you talking about? You make it a condition I don't want it. Yeah, like any contract. Like any contract. If both sides agree to the conditions, if both sides agree to the condition, then it's a valid condition. People can make contracts with one another of any kind that they want. By the way, you have to know the, the laws of civil law, let's say in, 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 in the Choshe Mishpat, they're only default laws. There's no re restriction on what kind of contract you can make. You can make a, con a, a contract with a condition that the word of a child can determine the outcome of the I owe a child is not an ape, but you took his word. So you, you can make any conditions. We can't assess the condition. I'm sorry? We can't assess this condition. He's made a condition that we cannot assess this. Well, okay, but the Gemara gives up sack. The Gemara gives up sack. She's suffering the Kodeshis. That makes a difference. She's going to have to get a get through. If she wants to get out, she can't just walk away. Because maybe they're married. I, the Menachas Chinus question is, how does he walk away from the, the chuppah in order to justify the Gemara's conclusion? 
And he says there is enough information. So let's try to figure it out. Let's see, let's try the other possibility. He walked up as Al Capone. He said on the condition that I'm a perfect tzaddik, and he walks out as the Chafetz Chaim. No There's no suffix there. Now you know he had thoughts of Jew in his heart. He's a changed person. The Gemara's Psaq wouldn't be right if he came out as the Chafetz Chaim. He's got to come out again as Al Capone. Al Capone on the way in, Al Capone on the way out. But still, he said those words under the chuppah. Maybe he had thoughts of tshuva at that moment, in which case it would be true that at that moment he was a perfect son. What does this illustrate? This illustrates temporary tshuva, right? Momentary tshuva. At that moment, because those are the thoughts in his heart, he qualifies as a perfect son. I should point out, he didn't say vidui, that's why we don't know, so it's not full tshuva, but it's the idea that when you have a thought in your mind, temporarily, even if you don't continue it, even though you don't maintain it, it's valid when you think it. So here too, says Mosquito, temporary tshuva is valid tshuva. That being the case, you have uh, you have the sense that, you, oh, by the way, you say, hamar is chan, hamar is loch, and feel who who forgives abundantly. Some say, I think it's about kind actually, say abundantly means when you do the same transgression over and over again. He will forgive you over and over again. Shabbat Yibol Tzadik Bekab, the Tzadik falls seven times. Tzadik is not a perfect person. I mean, contrary. Mishle says, Shabbat Yibol Tzadik Bekab, and he gets up. The Rosh is the person who falls seven times, and seven times he's out. Out for the count, as they say in boxing. And he's, and he's, he's knocked out. Falling doesn't mean that you're not a, you're not a Tzadik. All it just means that you have something to repair. Tshuva is this great, uh, great leverage that even though a person fails in his lifetime, he can leave the world perfectly clean with a perfect record because Tshuva can take care of the failures. So it's not that you're stamped with the past and, and, and uh, the, the stain of the past st- stays with you. I heard from my son, my son Nehemia, a few years ago, something which I didn't understand right away. He said, everyone dies with regrets. Think of, I thought about it. Oh, there's certain things that I did that I regret. They're like, I'm going away. They're in, the, they're in the record. So, of course, you think back. And you say, I wish I hadn't done it. And I thought to myself, that means that when you're dying, there's a certain krecht, oi. But then I thought to myself, well, maybe not. Because as we saw, regret is one of the conditions of tshuva. And if you do tshuva, you relieve the responsibility for those things. So you can feel pleasure in the regret. At least I regret it. At least I'm taking responsibility for it. I'm not, I'm not explaining it, and I'm not rationalizing it. I'm facing up to it, and I'm admitting I did something wrong. And that means that I leave the world without responsibility for that thing. So that can be a sense of great joy, not just a sense of, uh, of, uh, of the, the pain of having, having failed in the past. It's a pe- having done uh, the, the, the thing in the past and rect- rectifying. You take responsibility for it and rectifying it. But it says, by sin, you have to forget about it. You delete it. How can you have regret over something that you deleted and you have to He doesn't say forget. There's a word in Hebrew for forget. Mishkach doesn't say that. So what's the Yassim Rashapto? It means you shouldn't dwell on it. You shouldn't think about it. You shouldn't feel tempted by it and have to fight down the temptation all the time. You should try to to um, reorganize your your attitude towards it so that it doesn't play the same role in your life. Yasiro Mashato means it's not theirs. It's not thinking, it's not thinking about it. Not that he should forget it. I mean, there are lots of things that uh, you have forgotten. If you haven't forgotten, someone asks you about them, you say yes, but you don't think about them. And that's a big job. How you how you control thoughts. They say the Baal Shem Tov, when he was dying, as, as, as Talidim asked him, how can we recognize the Rebbe? With you gone, how do we know to, to, to receive from him? So who should lead us? So he says, this is what the story says. Ask him if he knows the secret of controlling thoughts, and if he says he does, don't take it. Now, I think the attitude that most people have is, thoughts hit me, they come out of the blue. Maybe I can be responsible for what I do in response to the thought. Dwell on the thought or, or uh, the plan, how to implement it or to evaluate it or to turn my mind to something else. But can I be responsible for the thoughts that enter my mind? 
I think we can, at least sometimes. Um, let's suppose you're living with your chabusa. Let's suppose you're negotiating a very important contract. Let's say preparing for a, 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 an occasion in court if you're a lawyer, right? How likely are you to be dis, dis, distracted by, I wonder who won the, the football game yesterday? You know, if you're appearing tomorrow in court, there's an important case, football won't come to your mind because your mind is filled with something that's important to you. So it's not a question of, I'm not going to think about X, that's famous, right? In my mind, the words are, I'm not going to think about X, then I'm thinking about X. So that doesn't work. But if you fill your mind with something else, when you're living with a chavrusa, and you know what chavrusa learning is, it's a lot of competition, you know? If I open my mouth, it's going to shoot me down. I better be very careful what I say. <laughs> so I'm thinking, how could I go wrong? What could he say? And he's thinking the same thing. Your mind is very focused. And since it's, it's very focused, very unlikely that other thoughts are going to pop into your mind. So if you learn to fill your mind that way, you can largely, I mean, not always can your mind be filled that way. It's not a perfect solution. That's a solution for a lot of the time. You know how great people used to go and recite Mishnayis while they were, while they were walking. In the Mishnayis about that, they would recite. Because part of their mind is occupied in the Mishnayis. That being the case, there's less room for it to be susceptible to uh, foreign thoughts that could, that could disturb. So far? That's good. Okay, so now um, there's another element of tshuva. We say, we say this every, every time, is, Dear Shu Hashem Behi Motso, Kro'u Biyosu Koro. Seek out Hashem when he's found, call to him when he's close. That means that Kushbrok was not equally close all the time. And then the Gemara says, When is that? The 10 days of Hashem Kim Kippur, which he called colloquially as Hashem Tshuva. That's a time when Kodesh Baruch Hu is close. But that's when it's telling you to call out to Kodesh Baruch Hu. And the Rambam writes, as others do, that's only for the Yochid, the Tzibur, whenever they do Tshuva, Kodesh Baruch Hu, uh, interacts with them. But for the Yochid, it's not so. Here's the explanation, an explanation for how it works. The person does an Avera, let's say in January. Well, by doing the Avera, he's taking a step away from Kodesh Baruch Hu. I'm talking about Bamezi now. He knows what he's doing. He realizes that it's wrong and does it anyway. That does happen, you know, once every six or seven years. That happens to people. So he, he takes, he's taking a step away from a Kodesh Baruch who's doing something against the Kodesh Baruch Hu's will. Simultaneously, a Kodesh Baruch Hu takes a step away from him. So there's a double distance set up. <coughs> now, let's say in February, the person does tshuva. Okay. He's closed the distance from his side. Is the Kodesh Baruch Hu going to close the distance from his side automatically? The answer is no. There's no guarantee. The Kodesh Baruch Hu has his Cheshwainas, and he decides how to handle the situation. That's true for all of the year except for Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, because there a Kodesh Baruch Hu comes first. He comes first before we do Tshuva. doesn't respond to our Tshuva, and therefore he's closed the distance from his side already. So that when we do Tshuva, the distance is at zero. We reconnect immediately. That's what it means that the tshuva is accepted, because he comes first. That's a gigantic, a gigantic chesed, and a gigantic vote of confidence. And it applies to something which some people ask. We have Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. Rosh Hashanah is Yom Adin. Judgments are being made, evaluations are being made. Yom Kippur is a day also, Yom Adin. But we do tshuva, and that's when Kapara can take place. That's when forgiveness can take place. Well, wouldn't it be better, perhaps, not give Kippur first? As it is, you go to your Rosh Hashanah, you may not have the tshuva, and you may not have been forgiven, and you're standing there on a day of Yom Adin with all the blemishes and all the stains. If you had your Kippur first, and you did tshuva, the Kodesh Baruch forgave you for all the things that you did. Then come to Rosh Hashanah and come clean. And you'll get a much better, young, uh, much better judgment. So uh, there's a, uh, I would say, a practical answer. If you know, Kippur came first, you wouldn't take it seriously. Yeah, you have Rosh Hashanah, you have Shofar, and two days, and then you have Slichos. And that's the lead up to uh, the young Kippur to make those wrenching decisions that have to be made to do Shuvah. I think there's another, uh, another uh, reason here which is, which is really very persuasive, and that is this. What's going on in Rosh Hashanah? 
one of the things that's going on, you see it over and over again, is we're proclaiming Kosh Baruch Hu King. Now, in the Hebrew language, there are various words for the political leader. One is Moshel, and uh, one is Sholet, and one is Dabar in, in classical Hebrew, and one is Melech. They're not the same. The word Melech requires that the people accept him as such. Otherwise, he isn't Melech. Ein Melech below Am. Ein Melech below Am is not what a six-year-old would hear. Yeah, if you're all alone, you can't be king. There's nobody to be king over. No, that's not what it means. It means without the people accepting him as king, he's not a king. So that means on Rosh Hashanah, as it's, we say, it's the coronation, it's the coronation day. We place the crown on Kosh head and make him king of the universe. Indeed, Moshe Shapiro, one of his Swaran writes that it's based on the wrong crown. The fact that Kosh Baruch Hu chose to be called Melech, first of all, means he chose a, a title which depends upon us, which being the infinite creator of the universe that a title that he possesses depends upon us is almost, almost inconceivable. How could anything about it depend upon us? But he chose it. And said, Rabbi Shapiro, this is a guarantee of the existence of the Jewish people. Because only we crown this king. Until the coming of the Mashiach, there may be individuals, but as an Am, as a nation, only we crown the king. And since he decided on that title of king, that means that we're going to be here to crown him king. Okay. So now, here we are at Rosh Hashanah, where Yom Kippur is after Rosh Hashanah. We may not have done Tshuva yet. And we're standing there with all of our faults still intact. But Baruch says, I want you to put the crown on my head. Could there be a vote of confidence more than that? That you, with your failures, with your shortcomings, with your mistakes, I want you to put the crown on you know, you build a person's self-confidence, you build his character by showing confidence in him. You really build a self-confidence if you choose him to do something for others where he feels that he's valuable because he made someone else's life. That's how you build self-confidence. Well, you won't find this in the psychology book, but uh, our, that's our, our understanding of self-confidence. Here, Kodesh Baruch says, I want you to proclaim me and make me king of the universe even before you've done Shuba, before you have uh, succeeded in, in your um, in your cleansing of, of yourself. Are we together so far? Yeah. Okay. Now, the Rambam says in Hitler's Shuba that Shuba is a tris with ne aparonius. A person who does Shuba doesn't get punished. Does not get punished. No more punishment. Well, in Perak Aleph of Hilfus Shuba, he quotes the Mishnah in Yuma that there are four Chalukai Kapara, the different types of transgressions. And each type of transgression needs a different process to be expiated, to be expunged. If it's a simple essay, like not benching after a meal, not putting on filling, when he does Shuba, it's over, it's all finished. If it's a simple loss essay, McDonald's, bacon cheeseburger, Simple loss, I say. But shouldn't even Kippur do it? If it's a, a, a loss, I say, that has a punishment of like Misbi De Shemai or Kores, a very serious punishment, then it requires Chuba Yom Kippur and Yisurim and suffering. And if it has those characteristics and also the Chilul Hashem, a public desecration of God's name, then it requires Chuba Yom Kippur, suffering, and death. So hold on, when you get to category three, he's telling me that tshuva isn't enough. Even tshuva Yom Kippur is not enough. It requires suffering. What requires suffering? What does the suffering do? And the answer is, this is absolutely crucial. It's not punishment because as we said, when you do tshuva, punishment is not shy. But there can be results of the transgression. It's a little bit like surgery for a, 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 inner uh, breakdown that was due to some bad behavior that the person uh, is motorcycle racing I hope this doesn't describe anyone here and you know and he breaks bones and he needs surgery and so on and so on well he could do tshuva for the, for the 
motorcycle racing. He can sell his motorcycle. He can tell his family he's never going to do it again. But they're the broken bones. And they need surgery for repair. That's not punishment for what he did. It's just that's the position he put himself into. And it gets consequences. And the consequences which, which cleanse him of the, resp- of the, of the results of what, he, of what he has done. So we have to understand that the suffering afterwards is something which we should welcome. Uh, one of the things that is said in the Shulchan Aruch, the Shabura, that when a person is experiencing suffering, Zolzayin kapara, we say. Let it be an atonement. Let this cleanse me from the things that I've done wrong, that I've already done to you before. So that when I leave the world, I can leave the world clean. A person who does tshuva, like I said before, a person who does tshuva leaves the world clean. He has a perfect record. His record is unblemished, no matter what he's done. No matter what he's done. A dover omei b'shnei tshuva. Nothing stands in the way, no matter how terrible it is. Rama writes that, and Tosfos writes it also, even though the Gemara seems to contradict it. Tosfos says that can't be the right shot. Because ain dover omei b'shnei tshuva. Even if what a person did left consequences, all actions leave consequences, but left serious consequences in the world, something's broken, someone lost something. Let's take among the worst murder. You can do shuva for murder, definitely can. And here you 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 come into something which could be in a certain sense a mystery. Menashe was one of the worst kings that the Jewish people ever had. And he, among other things, he instituted idol worship in the temple. And at the end of his life, he did tshuva. He got rid of all the idols and, uh, and reached the Surah Kosh Baruch in the correct way. And it's a Yerushalmi, if I'm not mistaken, which says that when he died, the question was, what's going to happen to him? <clears throat> and um, the angel said, well, he did tshuva, but look, his record was really, really over the top. He can't be forgiven for what he did. And they're all, all the paths of tshuva, which take you up to before Akash Baruch Hu, they blocked. Each path was blocked. What did Akash Baruch Hu do? He dug a tunnel under the Kisei Akavo, under the throne of glory, and brought him up with the, with the tunnel. Um, it's a midrash, it's a chazal. And the chazal are very, very careful with what they say. It's very important to understand what happened. The angels blocked the paths because Rome didn't open up the blocks. He left the paths blocked. What's the message? The message is when this angel says Menashe can't come up with this path, he's right. And not that path and not that path. The only shortcoming of the angels is they have tunnel vision. Okay, there are 16 paths. Oh, uh, we got 16 members. Block them all. You know, when the coach broke, who wants someone to be brought up. He doesn't have to use the 16th bit. He can use another one. So there really is an obstacle here. But ain gavra omei bifnei ha Nothing stands in the way of tshuva. So a person should never give up, never feel that, uh, that he's done something which is beyond, beyond uh, uh, the groups of tshuva. Uh, Elisha ben Avua, who left Torah and uh, rebelled against the Gersh Baruch and so on, and uh, student Rabbi Mayer tried to help him influence him to tshuva. And he said, I can't do tshuva. I heard Nachaya Pargot, a voice from heaven. Shuva bani shogavim, all my children who have gone off the path to return. Chutz me but not but not me. Ex- I'm excluded. Unfortunately, say he should have realized that that voice from heaven was not telling the truth. It was not telling the truth. It was, it was done to, to test it. He should have said, like Chizkiyo said to Yeshaya, when uh, Yeshaya said to him, you're going to die, Chizkiyo said to him, I have a tradition from my ancestor, David Amelech, never give up hope. And he turned his head face to the wall and he prayed, he lived another 20 years. The prophet is telling you he's going to die. He said, no, you can't be the country of David Amelech, that you cannot do. So a person should, should never give up. Whatever, whatever he's done, Shuvah can always, always be in something which, which stands in the way, protects him from, from punishment, and means he leaves the world clean. Anything else that has to happen is engineered by Coach Pearl, but he leaves the world clean. Now, there is some question 
about whether the last point that I'll show you. If you have questions afterwards, I'll, 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 I'll whether tshuva is a mitzvah or just a procedure. Or let me put it more clearly. Maybe of the 613 mitzvahs, some are just procedures. They're not required. You have a, a vessel that's tummy. You put it in a mikvah. You don't have to do that. You leave it tummy. Nobody requires you to do that. There's a mitzvah called tara, which you, it tells you if you put it in a mikvah in certain conditions, then it becomes tara. But that's just a procedure, that's all. Shechita. If you never shech an animal, you didn't miss out on one of the mitzvahs of the world. Shrita makes kosher meat. Okay, fine. Some people will do it, some will not do it. So maybe the Menchah Sinai actually takes this position. Maybe Chuba's like that. Chuba's just a procedure. You do things that are wrong, you want to escape responsibility and punishment for them, do Chuba. Not, not, it's up to you. And it's based on a peculiarity in the language of the Rambam in the first chapter of Menchah's Chuba, where he says, when you do tshuva, you have to really, they have to say be doing, but it doesn't say you have to do tshuva. So, Minchos Linam suggests maybe you don't have to do tshuva. But the truth is that in Perk Beis of Minchos Tshuva, the Raman says the following: Yom Kippur, soap with kates the tshuva like hole. La Yochid Ber Rabbi. Yom Kippur is the end of tshuva for everyone, the individual and the group. Now. And Allah Allah he said, which I didn't bring to you here, that you can do chuba on your bed, deathbed. If you do chuba on your deathbed, it's valid. You've done chuba and you are, are relieved of responsibility for all your t- transgressions. So when he says it's the end, it doesn't mean you can't do it afterwards. And he says, since it's so vacates, the ficha chayovim hakol lasos chuba, yochit barat. So you want the words, you have to do it, it's right there at the right base. It's not the very college, it's right there in the very face, that you have to do it. But you have to do it because it's Yom Kippur. But some people say, oh, you see Yom Kippur has its own mitzvahs. And one of the mitzvahs of Yom Kippur is to do tshuva. That's what he means. No, he doesn't mean that. Because the way in which that's expressed by a famous verse, lift Hashem titharu, purify yourself before a Baruch Hu, and you stand before a Baruch Hu in Yom Kippur, the Rambam doesn't bring that verse. On the contrary, his reasoning is, he says it's the end, so then that's why you have to do it. One of the first of the Rambam says the following thing. Let's think for a moment about filling. You have to put on filling in the day, but it takes 10 minutes. Let's say it's the day is from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. So, sometime or other, you have to put on filling. It's 4 in the afternoon, the person has to put on filling. I say to him, hey, it's 4 in the afternoon, how about putting on filling? I say, listen, I got two hours left. And he's right. As far as the bits of Phil is concerned, he gets 10 to 6, hasn't put on yet. He said, listen, uh, time's wasting, you know. It's, it's, the, it's the last chance. If he still doesn't do it, then he's violated the mitzvah he hasn't put on Phil in that whole day. When was the transgression? When we pinned the time of the transgression? The last 10 minutes? No. The definition of the transgression is a fillingless day. 12 hours, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., and nowhere in those hours do you have filling. That's the definition of transgression. The transgression is the whole time, as a result of the fact that nowhere in those 12 hours did you put on filling. Well, maybe Chuba is like filling. Maybe Chuba has a time for the mitzvah, your responsibility. The transgression was in January, the end time is Yom Kippur. Until Yom Kippur, if you didn't do Yom Kippur, uh, didn't do Chuba in July and in September, it would have been nicer to do it earlier, but you haven't violated the, the responsibility. But if Yom Kippur comes to an end, then this responsibility of Chuba you failed at. And in both of Yom Kippur, you now have two problems. You have a transgression in January, plus the fact that you failed to do Chuba in that period of time. So that's what the Rambam means. When he says it's the end, it means the end of fulfilling this responsibility that you triggered with the transgression in January. That has to be finished by the end of Yom Kippur. That being the case, that's why he says you're required to do it, because otherwise you violated that mitzvah which started in January with the transgression and ends at the end of Yom Kippur. 
And this can solve a famous problem because, according to some sources, not all sources agree with this, but according to some sources, on Rosh Hashanah, a person is a tzaddik whose majority of good is written in the Book of Life, and a person whose Russia, majority of bad, is written in the Book of Death, and those who are 50 50 are held over to Yom Kippur. And then, if they do tshuva, they're written in the Book of Life, and if they don't, they don't do tshuva, they're written in the Book of Death. So, the first thing you ask, wait a minute, there's 10 days there. They did a lot of misses in those days, don't they count? The answer is they don't count because the judgment is on last year. It's not on this year. These 10 days are going to go on this year's account. Okay. Now let's see. If he does tshuva, that's good. Because up until now, the scales are balanced. Good and bad. When he does tshuva, one of the bad is taken off. It's lighter. The shelf goes out like this. So that's why if he does tshuva, he changes last year's judgment into a judgment, a favorable judgment. But if he doesn't do tshuva, so, how does that push the scale down from last year? Why does failing to do tshuva push it down? Now, if you take the wrong this explanation of the wrong, you can explain it very well. What does it mean he didn't do tshuva? He came to the end of your kipper and he didn't do tshuva. Well then, there was a failure of not doing tshuva from January through October. That whole period of time is the time of the failure. That weighs down last year's scales also. That being the case, it's now getting a, job, a, a, a bad judgment on your last year. At any rate, this um, explanation, I think, helps to solve another problem that people ask. If there was a Shemba Simcha, you should serve a Kosh Brothel with joy. How exactly do you do Shuba with joy? We're really going to confront what I've done in the past. To honestly put aside the rationalizations and the explanations. And see if it for all it is and for all its glory and, and, and take responsibility for it, that's a painful process. It definitely is a painful process. But if you put it into the context that we have given it, I think you can see how to do this with joy. And that is, by regretting it, by taking responsibility for it, and by resolving not to repeat it, you then are relieved of responsibility for it. It's like Self-healing. It's like self-healing, self-rehabilitation. It's actually making yourself into a better person, which is what the grants you. So the fact that you, this is the process with that outcome, um, I, um, I, I guess most people share the feeling that I have uh, about Tachanam. It's a chosen and shul, I say, wonderful. Oh. Wonderful. No, there's no Tachanam. Right? By the way, you know what the Mishnah Guru says about that? Tell the chassan to go out. So you should say dachman. Nobody fulfills that, but that in Mr. as far as I know. I've never heard anybody do that. But, you know, because <laughs> dachman is tough. You know, not only does it take an extra five minutes, but it's tough. Right? Someone whom I know very well tells me that dachman fills that person with joy. Kodesh who said, you can slough it off. You can take it off. Kodesh Baruch will relieve you of it. Why shouldn't you be happy about it? Indeed, the Ramchal says, you daven before the Kodesh Baruch Hu, and you ask for things, and you hope that your asking will affect the Kodesh Baruch Hu's judgment as to what should be given to the world, and bring something good down into the world. And the uh, sources tell us that the Kachikim, the critics above say, who are you? Who are you? Standing before the creator of the world? And you want to bring good into the world? You're not worthy of that. Look at you. And something has to be done about it. And that's what Tachman does. Tachman responds to that critique by saying, no, it's not really me, and no, I'm not, I don't identify with that, and yes, I'm, I'm cleansing myself from that, so that you can justify the fact that you have the right to stand before the Lord's Bible and ask that the world be uh, given the hashpos, the divine energy from, the, from above. So that's something which can be done actually with joy. If there was a sham, the simple can apply even to that. Questions? Yeah. About 15 minutes ago, you were talking about how it's never too late to do tshuva, you do it the right way, all is forgiven, depending on what your affairs were and all these things. How does one, I mean, for instance, how do you not use that as an excuse? Use that, how do you not use that as an excuse to not make the right decisions today and tomorrow, knowing that 
I can still make up for it later down the line. Wonderful question. Uh, now, your question can be put two ways, and if there are two different ways, we'll have two different answers. One way is really, really um, uh, uh, criminal, and that is to say, I have a good deal here. Wait a minute. This is a great system, you know. Cheeseburgers today, cheeseburgers tomorrow, cheeseburger next year. Uh, three days before I die, I'll do tshuva. And I, I'm not going to be punished for any of it. Why shouldn't I have the cheeseburgers and also not be punished? Right? I get everything. That's incoherent. That's logically incoherent. I'll tell you why. Because the spirit in which that suggestion is made, the spirit of, I've got a good deal. I figured out a very good, sound strategy. But one element in the strategy is, Juba requires my regret. Regretting having done it. Thinking I shouldn't have done it. That's not going to happen. Because I'm saying now that it's a good deal. It's a right deal. It's a smart deal. I'm getting out of it all the, all the things that I want. You can't think that and also think later you're going to regret it. That's just incoherent. So I don't think that... Does it be a false regret? It will be, be a false regret. means it won't really be a regret, right? It can't be. Um, but if a person says, look, it's hard, and I've tried, and I haven't succeeded, and he, th then the, the, the trap is despair. And like uh, Rabbi Nachman said, you know, you is the end of the world. And uh, the Muslim Swarm said the same thing. The worst thing in the world is, is you, uh, where you, where you simply give up. I met someone, I lived in Baltimore, or, uh, 10 years, I met someone there, a non religious Jew, and he exuded such self satisfaction, such self confidence, it really irked me. You can imagine why, I suppose. So I said to him, Are you perfect? And he said, No. I said, Well, what are you doing to improve yourself? So he said, Nothing really. I said, Well, look, if something went wrong with your business, wouldn't you hire an expert to figure it out? Yes, and you're holding the roof of the house. Yes, so why aren't you doing something about yourself? He said, Rabbi. I accept myself as I am. I eat well, I sleep well. You know, I accept myself as I am. That's really you. So there's no, no, nothing going to be improved. And that really hurt me. So then I said, did he have children? Yeah, he's got a 12-year-old son. I said, imagine the police bring him home, and they say he was truant from school, and he was stealing in the local store, and bring it to you, and you said, what? He did that in school. And you steal, and he said, yeah, that. It's true, it's true, I was in school, I was stealing, but don't worry, I accept myself as I am. I eat well, I sleep well. What would you say to your son? At which point you remember an appointment and you broke up the conversation. <laughs> so, um, the, the, what you don't want is, that's who I am. That's just who I am. If you know that you can always do tshuva, that takes away that use, that despair of, I'm just making my face like a piece with reality. No, it's not true. Uh, reality is malleable, uh, reality is changeable. Every year at this time, we think about this, we focus on this, we study this, and we prepare for Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur and the experience of Rosh Hashanah Kippur also. And that tells us that, that, it, that there's always a chance we can always pick ourselves up. Very, very crucial part of self, self understanding, self knowledge. How do you explain the first line of the Ramadan then and the order? Oh, the so since. Sin, uh, 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 thank you for, 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 for mentioning. The first point is to be to to abandon the sin in the three ways that we mentioned, resolve not to go back to it. Then to regret, and then you call the Kodesh Baruch Hu as your witness that you mean it, that you're not going back to it. But without the regret, you don't have it because why are you why are you abandoning it? You could be abandoning it for any any number of selfish reasons. And if those reasons change, you would change your mind about abandoning it. No, I regret it because it was wrong, because it was bad. Then you can say, well, I really mean that I'm not going back to it. On the basis of the regret, it has to come after the regret. And the Pesach says that. After I, re I, uh, after I changed my, care, my course, I experienced the full sense of regret, and then I, and then I was able to, to, to do the that way. So I think, I think it fits in very well that way. As if it's testimony, I'm not going back to it. And he makes that it should have gone to the first, first section and not the second section. Okay, are there levels of tshuva that be below the ideal that Rebbe mentioned that you are clean and there's nothing you have to account for? Are there lower levels of tshuva that would leave some cleaning to do still? And would that apply to a Tinoch that would have the dinner of an ones? So, um, 
there are two things to be said here. First of all, if you do the mitzvah of tshuva, then everything is clean. You could do parts of the mitzvah of tshuva, okay. parts of the mitzvah, not the whole mitzvah. You will not have satisfied the mitzvah. But everything that you do is 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 uh, relevant and helps in the judgment that the Torah gives you. I'll give you a famous example. It says a person who confesses his sin but does not resolve to change is like someone who's toivel b'sheretz biyado. He goes into a mikvah with the dead lizard holding on to the lizard with his in the mikvah. And the normal understanding of that is that it's it's it's, it's hopeless. <laughs> in the water, he's becoming tummy because he's holding on to the sheretz. One of the before Shiva Narango said, Ultimate Shift to the Askina, we talk about a crazy person. Why is he coming to the mikvah? Why is he going swimming, you know, in the local pool or ocean or something else? Because he knows that he's tummy and he needs to become tummy. That's why he's going to the mikvah. Well, if so, why is he holding on to the sheretz? Because right now, he oh, hasn't okay, resolved yeah. to get rid of the sheretz. But going to the mikvah says, I want to be tall. That's not zero. Whoa. That's not zero. That's appreciated by a first world. Even that much is appreciated by a first world. I'll give you one more example. You all know the phrase conscience money? That's when a person steals money. He thinks, well, I'm stealing it, you know. That's not really so nice. I'll give some money to charity. <laughs> that way he solves his conscience and says, yeah, okay, I'll give you the charity, so I'm going to steal it's okay. And we all make fun of that. We say that's utterly corrupt, you know, because the fact that you give the charity doesn't justify the stealing. Does that mean that he's just a hypocritical criminal, just wicked? No, it doesn't. And I'll tell you why. Because we have a verse that describes real criminality. So for Rosh HaLatzadik, Mavakesh Hamito, the wicked person looks at the tzadik and wants to kill him. He wants to kill him. The fact that there are righteous people in the world, it, it, it crushes him. He wants to rid the world of the, the righteous person. That's not this guy. This guy will give money to a tzaddik, his conscience money. So he doesn't qualify for that level of Russia. That already shows that there's a positive element in him and that he's not, he's not fully lost. So any, any gesture of, of tshuva, any gesture counts. It's, you know, there are two types of mitzvahs. There's tefillin. If you have a crack in a letter in the tefillin, it's not tefillin. Any one letter, it's not tefillin. Stoka, you have to give a certain amount of money. If you only give half, the half you gave is a mitzvah. You need to give more, but it doesn't take away the, 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 the reward for the half that you gave. Shuba is like stoka. Any part of it that you do is relevant, and a great broker will give you up, appreciates it, and it will lighten the din that you get. You have to work towards the idea of, of the whole. And finally, if a person is onus, if a person can't do any more, then he gets credit for doing it. If he can't do any more, then he gets credit for doing it. This is illustrated in various types of elements of Shuba. Suppose somebody stole money, and eight years later, he says, oh, I stole that money. I've got to give it back. Where's Tony? The guy I stole it from. Well, three years ago, he moved out west. And this is 200 years ago. Moved out west. How am I going to find him? How am I going to locate him? I can't give it back. And, well, isn't one of the rules to give it back? It is. So do I sit and say, okay, okay I'm lost. I can't do it. I can't give it back. I'm not going to get atonement. And the answer is no. You give it to the best. And you say, listen, I owe this person this money. I stole it. Here it is. Maybe he'll come back. Maybe his heirs will come back. I hope some way it will come back to him. I don't want to have the stolen money by me. You give it to him, and you've done it. So you've done all that you can. And even though you're responsible for the fact that you can't do it, because had you done it right away, you would have known where he is. And you waited six years. It doesn't matter. If you do that, you qualify for atonement. And those who knows what kind of vocabulary I switch to atonement to tshuva, because Ramam says giving back is not part of tshuva. It's only his atonement. That's for the aficionados. That's why I changed my vocabulary there.